Support for LPB's 2021 Louisiana Young Heroes is provided by At AmeriHealth Caritas Louisiana, we help people get care, stay well, and build healthy communities. Care is the heart of our work at AmeriHealth Caritas Louisiana. And by the U.S. Army Baton Rouge Recruiting Battalion. Community Coffee and the East Baton Rouge Parish Library, with additional support from Hotel Indigo and Dimco. Entergy is proud to support programming on LPB and greener practices that preserve Louisiana. The goal of our environmental and sustainability initiatives really is to ensure that our kids and future generations can be left with a cleaner planet. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you. risk. I think we will see some cases go up. A new variant bringing back mask mandates. We all realize one day there are going back into our society. So we have to make sure that we're giving them the tools and resources they need. Reforming prisons in one Louisiana parish. She's been a big help for me this past year. This week's LPB Louisiana Young Hero. Hi everyone, I'm Kara St. Cyr. And I'm Andre Morrow. This week, pressure is mounting at the Capitol. Some lawmakers are working overtime to reverse bills that the governor vetoed after this past session. That's right, John Bell Edwards refused to sign a bill that would keep transgender girls from participating in girls' sports. He also struck down a concealed carry proposal that would nix the license requirement you need to carry a gun if you're 21 or older. Both the House and the Senate would need the approval of half of their chambers for this to work. And if it happens, it would be a first veto session since the modern Constitution was adopted in 1974. A special session would begin July 20th. Also happening this week, it's 225 versus the 504. Baton Rouge and New Orleans are officially rivals in the race to get vaccinated. Mayor Sharon Weston Broom for Baton Rouge and Mayor Latoya Cantrell in New Orleans put up a Twitter video announcing that the two cities are fighting to see who can win the contest. Now, the winner ultimately gets the bragging rights of beating the other city. To participate, you have to get the vaccine and enter the Shot for a Million contest that offers $100,000 prizes, scholarships, and a $1 million grand prize. Lastly, you have to recommend your family members and friends get the vaccine too. So far, Baton Rouge is lagging behind with 40% of the population vaccinated. New Orleans is approaching 60%. The challenge, should you choose to accept it, lasts for 30 days and it started July 1st. And now to other headlines making news across the state. The pink tax is now officially a thing of the past. People won't have to shell out any extra dollars to buy tampons, diapers, or any other feminine hygiene products. The governor signed a bill eliminating all of that. But the tax break won't happen overnight. The state stands to lose about $11 million in collections, and the lawmakers need a moment to adjust. Right now, the exemption is set for July 2022. A new chlorine plant is coming to southwest Louisiana after being destroyed in Hurricane Laura. Plans for Biolab Inc. in Westlake were announced Wednesday. Governor John Bell Edwards and the buyers say the plant will produce more swimming pool products and create jobs for people who lost them after the fire. The company's owners say the lab will add 82 more jobs with an average salary of $76,000. The plant is expected to be fixed next year. Louisiana's wetlands are starting to get national attention, but not for good things. Erosion, sinking land, and sea rise has captivated the interest of NASA. The Space Association is dropping $15 million on special equipment to study the Louisiana deltas. The research will be used to create computer models that can be paired with satellite data to find out which deltas can be saved and which ones are gone for good. To be specific, scientists will be looking at water flowing in and out of Louisiana's basins, sediment carried by it, and plants that can slow the flow, trap sediment, and pull carbon from the air. 
a small tragedy coming from the Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries. Bruno the bear is no more. After a growing social media following from walking hundreds of miles from the Midwest down south, the black bear's expedition was cut short near the Arkansas state line. He was hit by a car in northeast Louisiana. The bear was euthanized after breaking both legs in the accident. A manager of the large carnivore program says there was no way for him to live and lead a comfortable life after that. Bruno was found laying down in someone's backyard in Morehouse Parish when the department got the call for help. You've probably heard the phrase Delta variant several times this week, and that's because health officials are worried this new strain of COVID could cause a disaster by the fall. Dr. Joseph Cantor with the Louisiana Department of Health says if Louisiana isn't careful, we could see pockets of outbreaks across the state. The U.S. is faring a lot better than other countries when it comes to COVID-19, but we're still at risk for an outbreak. The Delta variant first found in India is now in every state in the country, including Louisiana. Any virus that transmits across the world and through time goes through minor um, mutations, variations. And, you know, almost always these mutations are irrelevant. They happen every single time that the virus transmits from one person to another. 99.9% .9 of the time they're insignificant, but every now and then you have a variant that is significant and changes the dynamics of the variant. And the Delta variant is one of the strains that changes the dynamics. This version of COVID is similar to the Alpha strain or the UK variant. You'll still get the same symptoms, shortness of breath, soreness, dry cough, but it's more dangerous. The Delta variant is more easily spread and those that do get infected are more likely to experience severe side effects. This variant has proven to be more transmissible, perhaps even 60% more transmissible than what the dominant strain of COVID is now. It is more than likely more virulent, meaning it's more dangerous meaning if you get it, you're more likely to get sick, more likely to require hospitalization. In other parts of the country, officials are reinstating mask mandates to keep people safe. Even the World Health Organization is asking people to wear face coverings and social distance again. More transmission, more variants. Less transmission, less variants. In Louisiana, no such guidance has been given yet, but experts do expect the number of Delta variant cases to jump in the next month or so. We're more at risk. I think we will see some cases go up, and what we're going to see is pockets of the state that have not done as good a job getting people vaccinated are going to be at most at risk. That's where we're going to see more cases and more hospitalizations. Cantor says there isn't a clear sign of a fourth wave, but he can't completely rule it out, especially because Louisiana is located in a hot spot for the variant. Experts are expecting the southern region of the country to see pockets of outbreaks. And the reason is simple. People aren't vaccinated here. Only about 38 percent of the state has initiated the vaccination process, which is well below the national average. That, coupled with hot weather and rain conditions forcing people inside, is enough for cases to boom again. Cantor says your best line of defense is still getting vaccinated. The Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines are upwards of high 80s, low 90s percent effective against this variant, particularly if you get both doses. If you only get one dose of the series, they're only about 33 percent protective. But if you complete the series, if you get both doses, high 80s, low 90s percent coverage, which is excellent. We're very thankful for that. So this variant is spreading quite rapidly. In fact, the CDC estimates that the amount of Delta variant in the country is doubling. We only have 19 confirmed cases in Louisiana, but it's likely that number is inaccurate. There aren't tests to confirm which variant you have, so Cantor says it's best to assume that we've got more cases. It's true that Louisiana has more people behind bars than the rest of the country, but it's also true that the state is reforming the way it incarcerates people. Tonight, you'll see prison reform strategies from two different states and hear how Louisiana compares from a group of experts. A person can end up in prison for multiple reasons, drugs, theft, the list goes on. But once someone served that sentence, how do you incorporate them back into society? When inmates come here, they're assigned to a, a certain job. 
The film Zoo Crew, Constance, and Parish Prison analyzed that question. Whatever happened to locking people up? Jamila Johnson, a Louisiana civil rights attorney, says rehabilitation in most Louisiana prisons isn't really a priority, and the inmates notice. And what we get most often are requests for transfers to facilities where there might be a job program or transfers to a facility which might have a better chance at education. And so what you have is this patchwork of individuals who it seems much like the luck of the draw, whether you're going to get a chance to really gain the skills to be successful when you come home. And that shouldn't be the way that our system operates. But the Plaquemines Parish Detention Center is a little different. Instead of having a standard Louisiana prison where inmates serve their sentence and leave, this place focuses on getting them back on their feet. Here, they learn valuable skills that they can use later on. If they don't have a lot of education, this place tries to provide that. Captain Byron Williams works with the Plaquemines Parish Sheriff's Department, which is highlighted in the film, Parish Prison. He says that getting GEDs and educational courses is essential and that inmates that finish the program usually show promising results once they leave. Once we, um, we all realize one day they are going back into our society, so we have to make sure that we're giving them the tools and resources they need that they can be productive and find what is their career path and what is their career goals. Job programs like those offer inmates a sense of confidence, which we learn in both films Parish Prison and Zoo Crew. But in Zoo Crew, inmates are given the chance to work with animals. It gives them a sense of independence and purpose. We want it to be a good experience for them too, because it's very important that we do that. Johnson says that giving people an opportunity to work while inside prisons can help inmates adjust for the real world, especially if those jobs teach valuable skills. With Zoo Crew, you saw the responsibility aspects, being somewhere on time, having tasks, that translates. But the thing that we can do that's the most helpful is really give people skill sets that they can use in the market and identify those and help people translate the work that they do while incarcerated to the jobs that they can see in the future. In the last film, Constance, Victoria County, Texas, is trying to improve jail time differently. The criminal district attorney, Constance Philly Johnson, tries to change the way the system functions. She wants to implement specialty courts, which do dole out punishments for broken laws, but it also offers you treatment. For instance, in the film, the DWI court Johnson founded is specifically for people who drive drunk. In addition to legal action, the court offers treatment to get sober, which wasn't always popular. Just like a lot of officers, in the beginning of my career, I was very linear in the way that I looked at criminal justice system. You go out, you find the crime, you arrest the bad guy, you put him in jail, he goes to prison. But like Constance, Louisiana programs want to do more than that. Captain Brown says programs like the DWI one exist in Plaquemine Parish. Instead of alcohol treatment, they offer anger management courses and some counseling. We've been in operation now for six years, so we had an opportunity to massage this living document several times to get it to this point. And knowing that um, the criminogenic models, we're looking at needs and risk. So upon orientation, the first week that those individuals are here, we do the DSM-5, which um, tells us if they have a substance abuse issue or a um, mental health issue. Um, I'm sorry, a substance abuse issue or alcohol abuse issue. And um, on the flip side, we do a psych social to see if they have any mental health issues. It'll take some time for all these programs to be routine for all prisons in the state, but reform is happening slowly in Plaquemine Parish. We showed each of these films in an online screening and panel discussion. If you want to watch that full panel, you can visit lpb.org justice. This week, we highlight our final LPB Louisiana Young Hero. She'll be a college freshman this fall after overcoming a year of personal tragedy in which she continued to lift up her community and those around her. Hannah Lewis heads to college at Louisiana Tech on an outstanding student merit-based scholarship after a senior year that tested every realm of the DeRitter native's life. The coronavirus pandemic already meant her first semester would take place virtually with all instruction online. But she also endured the death of her mother and two hurricanes that damaged her home. She's beautiful and lovely and she's well grounded and she's active in her church and she's very uh, she's got a strong faith and she's been very strong for me this past year um last year you know i had a happy uh 
happy life. I had a family of four and we had this home and everything and a hurricane came and then my wife, her mother suddenly and unexpectedly passed away and then another hurricane came and it was just the three of us. And I, I took that pretty hard and she took it hard too, but she was very strong for me. She, she's been a big help for me this past year. It seems helping and being involved is just part of her DNA, including academic, civic, and community activities. After the storm, she helped with feed feed uh, feed families with the um, disaster relief programs and and um, stuff like that, from handing out MREs to serving yeah. food and meals on the hot lunch line. We did that. Lunch that was about a week time where I was doing several of those events. But it's like to me, that's just kind of normal life stuff. Like all of the events and school clubs and functions I was part of when I was at Maryville, those were available. There weren't a whole lot of extracurricular programs at Maryville. I mean, there were, but there wasn't necessarily a gifted program or anything like that. And so this past week, I was part of a local children's play that they do every summer. And that was a lot of fun. Um, I've only ever gotten to do it one other year, but I was a senior, so it was really awkward because all the other seniors have done it for like six years. And um, it was a lot of fun. Um, a lot of my friends are part of it and it was storybook themed. And I got to be Dorothy from Wizard of Oz and I got to make my own dress. I saw that. It was a lot of fun, um, but I woke up yesterday and was like, whoa, I don't have to go to the theater today. It's like a whole, <laughs> like my whole past week is just totally different. She should have done it for three years, but it was canceled last year, you know, yeah. so yeah. Sure, she sure. did 2019 and this year, so. She hasn't declared a major yet, but knows her ability to communicate her passions will be part of whatever she does. I like history. I like science. I like um Dad was talking about how I'm a fantasy reader or whatever, but I think that's a misrepresentation. I like to study Tolkien's writings about what fairy tales are, what their philosophies was, the philosophy of him and his other colleagues, C.S. Lewis, how they thought, you know, children should be approached, how they thought children should be addressed, written to, written about, um, what this means, how this connects to sort of their apologetics or their faith. It's just very interesting things that they wrote about. Um, and I like to study that a lot. I think it's really, really interesting. Um, but that's sort of the only branch of literature that I like to take a super deep dive into. Everything else is just kind of goes over my head. <laughs> um, yeah, but that clearly doesn't go over your head and you have taken some what of a dive into it. So you can talk about it on a pretty deep level uh, with pretty much anybody who's a, a scholar of it, it sounds like. I, like. I think she would be a great teacher. She says she doesn't want to be a teacher. I think she'd be a great teacher at the university. She'd be a great teacher of young young children. I've seen her teach in, in church and Sunday school classes and Bible schools and things. And I think she would be a great teacher. I think storytelling is an incredibly powerful tool that we have and I think it's one of the most important tools that we have it's it's a sub branch of how we communicate like we communicate through speaking through conversation and through telling stories and I think it's very very powerful so whatever I do with my life with my career I want to be telling people the stories of my friends the stories of what they've gone through in their lives stories of how they've overcome things the stories of what you know cultures from thousands of years ago meant to us i just i think it's such a powerful thing i want to use my passions to put smiles on people's faces whether i do that through telling stories whether i do that through building things whether i do that through volunteer work i think that's something that's incredibly important and i think a little goes a long way and congratulations to all of this year's louisiana lpb young heroes the name Jimmy Fitzmaurice was prominent on the Louisiana political scene from the 1960s to the 1980s. He died this week with his family at his side. In exclusive interviews with LPB, Fitzmaurice remembered the political side of his life and what that stood for. James E. Jimmy Fitzmaurice Jr. was born in New Orleans in 1921 in the Broadmoor neighborhood. He grew up during the Great Depression when Huey Long had captured the imagination of Louisiana. I remember so vividly, particularly on Sunday night, the radio, we didn't have television in those days, and, and radio was very prominent. And uh, Huey Long would come on radio and he'd say, now this is Huey Long and I'm gonna play some music and I want you to get on the telephone and call your friends and tell them that I'm on. And I'm gonna give you about 10 or 15 minutes to do that. And you'd be amazed at the number of people, my dad included, 
that would immediately get up and get on the telephone and start calling his friends and other people we call their friends to tell them to get on the, uh, the turn on the radio and listen to Huey Long. Fitzmaurice graduated from Jesuit High School and attended Loyola University before joining the Army. It's there he developed an interest in politics. When I went in the Army, they would tease me because I was from Louisiana and they'd want to know about Louisiana politics. And, and consequently, that uh, whet my appetite uh, on that. And then I just decided uh, one day that I would, I would try to run for public office. And my mother always thought that politics was a terrible business. And I never shall forget when I told my mother I was going to run, she said, son, please don't run for politics. She said, it's a dirty, rotten, filthy business. And after I finished some 30 years of being in politics, somebody asked me, what did I think? And I said, I thought my mother was right. Fitzmaurice had several high-profile political losses, including the New Orleans mayoral race of 1969. However, in 1971, he was elected as Louisiana's first full-time lieutenant governor. You must remember that in my first four years as lieutenant governor, I was lieutenant governor, president of the Senate, president of the Board of Pardons, and uh, president of the Board of Commerce and Industry. So I had four major jobs wrapped into one. Fitzmaurice forged a new path with the role, building strong relationships with Governor Edwin Edwards and with businesses around the state. One thing any person runs for a lieutenant governor has to understand, he has to have a relationship with the governor, a good, bad, or indifferent. Uh, because after all, the governor is a governor. And I made it very plain to the governor that I was there to serve the people of Louisiana. I wasn't there to serve Jimmy Fitzmaurice. And I wasn't there to think about the next election. I was there to try to do a job for the state. And I viewed my role uh, completely different, perhaps, than others would have viewed it. First of all, I started from scratch, ground zero. I had nothing to go by. And, and I always uh, prided myself at being a pretty good salesman. And I felt that I could help the state tremendously by traveling all over the, all over the country and meeting with uh, companies that were domiciled in Louisiana and letting them know that uh, we were grateful for their being here. And as a result of that, if they ever had any problem, I was their contact. Don't worry about calling the department head or the director of streets to transfer. Call me. His tactics paid off. Proud of the fact that when I left office in 1979 as lieutenant governor, Louisiana led the nation in industrial growth. Very proud of that. It's not what I said. It's what the Wall Street Journal said. In spite of the accolades, honors, and successes he experienced over his long life, Fitzmaurice believes his legacy is simply about service. It's not a question about what I did. It's a question of what we did. We did. I always believed in bringing people together and making people part of the team. If you try to take success for everything that happens, you're going to be a complete failure. It doesn't work that way. It can't be big me and little you. It's got to be us. People go in public life for many different reasons. Some people go in for power. Some people go in for money. Some people go in for, for, for self-glory. Other people go in to serve. That's what I tell young people today. Serving is the most important word in government. How well can you serve? How much can you do in the interest of other people? Jimmy Fitzmaurice was 99 years old. And everyone, that is our show for this week. Remember, you can watch anything LPB anytime, wherever you are, with our LPB app. The download is free from the App Store. You can catch LPB news and public affairs shows, as well as other Louisiana programs you've come to enjoy over the years. And please, like us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We leave you now with some pictures of Lake Prelourde and St. Mary Parish. If you are vaccinated, you can visit all of the state parks for free. For everyone at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Andre Morrow. And I'm Kara St. Cyr. Thanks for watching. That's the state we're in.
Support for LPB's 2021 Louisiana Young Heroes is provided by At AmeriHealth Caritas Louisiana, we help people get care, stay well, and build healthy communities. Care is the heart of our work at AmeriHealth Caritas Louisiana. And by the U.S. Army Baton Rouge Recruiting Battalion. Community Coffee and the East Baton Rouge Parish Library, with additional support from Hotel Indigo and Dimco. Entergy is proud to support programming on LPB and greener practices that preserve Louisiana. The goal of our environmental and sustainability initiatives really is to ensure that our kids and future generations can be left with a cleaner planet. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you. <laughs> 